So have you ever stopped to think about what's actually running under the hood of your computer? Your operating system, your web browser, those huge blockbuster video games. Well, there's a really good chance a language called C++ is doing the heavy lifting. It's been an absolute giant in the industry for decades. So today we're going to dig into its story, where it came from, what makes it so special, and why even after all these years, it's still so unbelievably important. All right, so here's our game plan. We're going to start with the one single problem that kicked this whole thing off. Then we'll look at how C++ was actually born and got its clever name. After that, we'll see how it grew from a personal project into a global standard, get into the core ideas behind its design, and finally, we'll see where it's powering our world today. You know, this whole story doesn't start with some grand vision or a corporate plan. Nope. It all begins back in 1979, with just one programmer at his desk stuck with a really frustrating choice. And this was the big question. A young Danish computer scientist, Bjarne Straustrup, was working on his PhD, and he found himself caught in this classic trap, right between two totally different worlds of programming languages. This right here was his dilemma. On one side, he had a language called Simula. It was beautiful, it was elegant, it was amazing for organizing huge, complicated projects. But it was just painfully slow, impractical. Then, on the other side, you had BCPL. This thing was an absolute speed demon, super fast and efficient. The problem? It was so low level, so basic, that trying to build a massive piece of software with it was a total nightmare. So he had to choose elegance or speed. But here's the thing about Bjarne Straustrup. He didn't want to choose. He thought, why can't I have both? So while he was working at ANT Bell Labs, he decided, you know what? I'm just going to build it myself. He set out to forge a new path by taking a classic, powerful language and making it better. He picked a C language as his foundation, and for some really smart reasons. C was already fast, it was portable, which just means you could run it on all sorts of different computers, and a lot of people were already using it. So he took that solid base and started adding the features he loved from Simula, like the idea of classes, which is basically a way to group your data and your code together to keep things neat and organized. Well, as the project got bigger and better, it was pretty obvious that C with classes was, well, it was a bit of a mouthful. It didn't really capture what the language was becoming. So in 1983, a buddy of his, Rick Machitti, came up with a new name, something way more clever, a little technical, and kind of an inside joke for programmers. And this is it. The name C++ comes straight from the C language itself. See, in C, the plus plus is an operator that means take this value and add one to it. It's a clever little nod that says this new language is an increment of C. It's the next step up. It's C, but evolved. Now, this brings up a really common point of confusion. A lot of people will tell you C++ is just a superset of C, meaning you can take any C code and it'll just work. But that's not exactly right. Think of C++ more like a stricter older sibling. It has tighter rules to help you avoid mistakes. For example, there are certain things C will let you do with memory that are a little loosey-goosey, but C++ steps in and says, nope, you need to be more specific here, all for the sake of safety. And what started as this one guy's personal project pretty quickly started to take on a life of its own. It snowballed, really, transforming into an international standard that now guides millions of developers all over the world. And this timeline is so important because it proves that C++ is not some dusty old relic. Yeah, it started back in 79 and went commercial in 85. It got its first official standard in 1998. But the real revolution was in 2011. C++11 added so many incredible new features that people started calling it modern C++. And it just keeps going with major updates every few years, like C++20 adding even more power to the toolbox. It's a living, breathing language. Okay, so what's the big idea here? What really drives the design of C++? It's not just a grab bag of features, you know. It's all built on a really solid and consistent philosophy. This quote from Strustrup himself just nails it. The whole point is to let you, the programmer, create these beautiful, high-level ideas, these abstractions, without forcing you to pay for it with slow performance. It's all about building powerful, elegant things that still run incredibly fast. And these core principles really show you how. It's all about being practical. The zero overhead principle is huge. It basically means if you don't use a fancy feature, you shouldn't have to suffer any performance hit for it. It's also designed to be as close to the bare metal as you can get, giving you complete manual control over the hardware whenever you need it. It trusts the programmer. 
Okay, history, philosophy, check. But why does any of this actually matter? Well, it matters because C++ is the invisible, unstoppable engine behind so much of the technology you use every single day. No joke, just look at this list. The very core of operating systems like Windows and big parts of Linux, C++. Those blockbuster video games with insane graphics, their engines are built with C++ because you need to squeeze out every single drop of performance. Your web browser, the servers that run Amazon, the databases that hold everything together, even apps like Photoshop, they all rely on C++. And when performance is life or death, like on a space probe millions of miles from Earth, C++ is the language you trust. So when you boil it all down, the story of C++ is really the story of solving that one fundamental conflict, the trade-off between elegant, high-level design and raw, low-level speed. And for more than 40 years, it has not only survived, but thrived, because that problem is still at the heart of our biggest, most demanding software. And that just leaves us with one final thought. What's the next big problem it's going to solve?